Good evening. Welcome to the January 24th meeting of the Murfreesboro City School Board. We're glad to have those of you in the audience with us. We're glad to have those that are watching at home. During our moment of silence this evening, I'd like for you to remember the family of Carolyn Miller. Carolyn was a lady who did a lot of catering and provided us with a lot of good meals for several of our meetings. She passed away with service was this week. But right now, first we're going to stand for our pledge, led by Savannah Wiggins, third grade student at John Pittard, and also Adeline Shelton, an integrated pre-K student at Northfield. Oh. And now our pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I'm on the south. Thank you. All right, members of the board, you have received a copy of the printed agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved. It was West. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. <laughs> Second. Good deal. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 And I see no opposition. Thank you very much. All right, communications. Ms. Trail? Good evening, Board. Good evening. I want to start by saying happy National School Board Week. Uh, you got some goodies from our schools yes. as you entered today, and we are so proud to have this entire crowd to celebrate with you and to thank you for what you do. I'm sure they all showed up for okay, you because of that. School board appreciation. We do want to say thank you for your time and the service that you give to our schools, our staff members, our community. Uh, we know it takes a lot of effort. We hope it's worth it. We think it is. So thank you so much. And I hope you have a great week. Um, Mitchell Nielsen Primary would like to thank Mars Pet Nutrition and specifically Ms. Shalita Fuquay for adopting 40 of the primary students and helping make their Christmas wishes come true. We're gonna continue to have lots of holiday thank yous as uh, probably all the way through February. Uh, Bradley Elementary or Bradley Academy is inviting the community to the 2023 African American Cultural Celebration this Thursday evening, January 26th from 5 to 7 p.m. The event will be held at Patterson Park and again, that's a work together, working together with Patterson and Bradley to bring that uh, evening to you. Five to seven, I think performances start around 5.15. The meal starts at five. So that was for you, Mr. Suttles. <laughs> <laughs> also, uh, we wanna say congratulations to our two district teachers of the year. We named those yesterday. Uh, so Stephanie Fontaine, fifth grade teacher at Irma Siegel Elementary, and Katrina Gannon, kindergarten teacher at Overall Creek Elementary, have been selected as our district teachers of the year. As you know, this is brought to you from um, the grouping the, of our school-based teachers of the year. And we will be celebrating our school-based teachers of the year as well as our district teachers of the year in April. One more before I give up this podium, we want to also say congratulations to Mr. Don Barch. Mr. Barch was selected as our Murfreesboro City School Principal of the Year, mm -hmm. and Ms. April Savisa was selected as our Supervisor of the Year. So we've had lots of celebrations this month. With that, I want to give it back over to Dr. Duke to talk about why this huge crowd is here. So. That's right. Uh, good evening, uh, board, and for our Spotlight on Education tonight, we have lots of guests with us, and I can tell you a uh, few things make me as happy as having a boardroom full of students uh, to remind us all of what we do every day, so thank you students for being here, and thank you families. But I'm actually going to introduce, uh, or ask, not introduce, ask Dr. Christina Boone, Principal of Discovery, to come up. This past November, the Beta Club of the Discovery School participated in the state beta competition at Opryland in Nashville. Uh, we are so proud proud of their many accomplishments and tonight I would like Dr. Boone to introduce some of her students, talk about what they did. This was the first
first competition they've had in two years, so it was nice for them to be able to go back this year. So, Dr. Boone, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you introduce this fine group of students you have with you tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you for taking the time tonight to recognize Discovery School's beta team. I would like to ask my students and the stars tonight to come and stand with me behind the podium as well as our phenomenal coach team that is able to be here tonight. So in, in just a moment, I'm going to have our beta vice president share with you uh, the results of the hard work that has been produced from our students. But first, on behalf of the board and myself, I want to take a moment to personally thank our coaching team. Our head coach, Mr. Page, mm -hmm. back in the back, of course, behind the students. Uh, Mr. Page. Yes, he has served as one of our head coaches for over a decade now, and it is truly because of his commitment to Beta and his willingness to volunteer endless hours, uh, one of the big reasons why Beta exists at our campus. His team this year, it's changed over the years, and want to say a huge thank you to our sixth grade teacher, Dr. Campbell. She was one of his uh, co co-coaches this year and gave as well many hours to support our students. The other members of the coaching team that were not able to be here is Dr. Kleppinger, our music teacher, Miss Beth Warren, who is our interventionist, and Miss April Green, who is one of our science EAs. Uh, it is because of their hard work and dedication, as well as you can see, our parents show up, mm -hmm. they are committed, they are dedicated just as much as our students, and because of all of that commitment of the adults, our beta has become one of, a, uh, one of the most successful and enriching opportunities that students are able to uh, be a part of at Discovery. So thank you again for taking the time to recognize them. But without further ado, we have lots of stars shining tonight, and I'm going to introduce one of the ones uh, that I think you will love to hear and meet. She is actually our beta vice president. She ran for president at the state convention uh, because the president was not able to attend Attend. She did a phenomenal job, and her campaign was The Price is Right, and I think she definitely is uh, right for this job. So, no further ado, Ms. Michaela Price. Hello, my name is Michaela Price, and I'm here to tell you all about Beta Club Convention. Being at Beta Club was one of the best experiences because it helped me grow my leadership skills and I got to learn more about my colleagues. My, one of my favorite experiences at Beta Club was going on that stage and projecting my speech. And when I was done, I had a crowd of students cheering me on <laughs> and helping me throughout the way. I made many friends like the campaigning. I, I had a campaigning squad, which were some of my friends. I also had... I also made new friends, the candidates, and unfortunately, I didn't win the debate, but I won a great lesson. Now, this is, there is a lot of things I could say about Beta Convention, like the store that we had and my speech, because I've had a lot of experience in leadership. I've been a Girl Scout since kindergarten. I've been a school ambassador. And I've done a lot of things for my com community through Girl Scouts and my school. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce some of the students that won us some awards. So in second place in fourth grade math, we have Mr. Adife. In second place in sixth grade math, we have Andrew. In fifth place, in fifth grade math, we have Hashem. In third place, in jewelry, we have my friend Vivian Fry. <laughs> third place, in color photography, was our wonderful June. Also, this duo got first place and a golden ticket in performing arts, and this is Catherine and Plessley. <laughs> we 
we also got fourth place in apparel, training pin, and first place in our banner, and that goes to our design team. <laughs> And last, but definitely not least, we got first place in engineering, all thanks to our engineering team. <laughs> we won several other placements in various categories, and all students, even some not present tonight, have qualified for National Beta Convention held this summer. We had approximately 60 students take part in beta this, year, this past year. Thank you to the board, the district, our coaches, our parents, and this school for supporting this opportunity for all of us. Beta Club Convention was a great way for us to grow on the four pillars of beta, which are leadership, service, character, and achievement. And as a school, we have achieved a great victory together. Thank you for your time. Where was the convention held? Uh, sure, it was Thanksgiving weekend. <laughs> so it was uh, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Yeah, Saturday, Opryland. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday Opryland. before uh, before Thanksgiving. So yes, uh, Mr. Campbell, Mr. Page. So Dr. Campbell, myself, and some of us coaches attended multiple days, but Mr. Page here stayed the entire time with every student uh, and supported them. So, and I will say this about Discovery School and say this in opportunity to our parents. Every one of our parents shows up and is a part of that. So the liability that is put on educators is lessened because of their support as parents. So I am tremendously grateful for the parents we have at Discovery and their support. That is awesome. Yes. And it was on a Thanksgiving break. So kudos to our support staff and, or excuse me, from our staff from their willingness just to do this even more so. Great. Lord, do you have any questions? Wow. I have a, a comment okay. to make um, just about Michaela, who we just heard from. So I don't think this will surprise anyone after hearing that. But um, I had the opportunity to watch your speech that you gave at Beta Convention. Literally gave me chills. You are just fantastic leadership potential, and I know we'll hear from you in the future. So congratulations, everybody. That is awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you, and congratulations. That just goes to show, you know, so many times we hear the negatives about young people. And this is a group that expresses to everybody and lets everybody know how great young people. It's only a small minority that are negative, but this group and others are positive. Thank you very much. You have represented all of us very well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Duke? All right, we're going to continue on with the recognitions tonight. So again, I want to personally again say thank you to our Beta Club. I am so proud of what you guys are representing for Murfreesboro City. And we always talk about the best of MCS. Mm -hmm. I think all of you guys represent the best of MCS. So, but with that, we're going to recognize another individual tonight um, for our best of MCS recognition. <clears throat> Excuse me. And tonight we're recognizing an educator who has served with Murfreesboro City Schools for many years. So I'm going to ask Miss Tammy Case to join me at the podium tonight. Miss Case is currently the academic interventionist at Northfield Elementary School. Miss Case has been in Murfreesboro City for 30 years, and throughout her career, she has served at both Mitchell Nielsen and Northfield, teaching first, second, and third grades before moving into her current role as an interventionist. In this role, she is able to work with students in all grade levels across the school to help make sure they have the skills needed to access grade level content and standards. Ms. Case told me that she enjoys working as an academic interventionist because in this role, she can support and advocate for students. In her wor words, she stated, I am able to build relationships in small groups and see students grow and progress throughout their elementary education. Our academic interventionists play a vital role in the success of our students, and we are thrilled to recognize Tammy for the great work she is doing. Ms. Case was nominated for this honor by her principal, Mrs. Campbell. 
Ms. Campbell stated that Tammy Case is a shining light at Northfield Elementary. Mm -hmm. Over the past year, Tammy has overcome many personal and professional obstacles, yet she still comes to school with a smile every day. Mm -hmm. Ms. Case is the first face that many see each morning as she greets students with her sunglasses and her rolling radio, <laughs> rain or shine, which <laughs> gotta love that. Tammy is flexible, professional, and does whatever it takes to get the job done. She strives to have perfect attendance as often as possible, and when it's time to help out in any way, Tammy's answer is always yes. She maintains a positive atmosphere for students and adults in her classroom. Ms. Case, I know the school board and as a district, we wanna say thank you for your incredibly important work that you do each day. Your commitment to our students is not only changing their immediate lives, but we know you're changing their future as well. We are a better district because you serve with us, and we wanna say thank you for representing the best of MCS. Mm. Thank you guys so much. Um, I just love working for Murfreesboro City Schools. <laughs> Thank you. We love to have you working for Merce Person. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a motion to approve the consent items as printed? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Suttles. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. All right, action items, the board policy 2.805. Yes, sir, we have several policy amendments to present to the board tonight as part of our regular review of district policies. The first is 2.805, which governs the district's purchasing policies and procedures. This amendment updates the title of the district's purchasing agent, and we are recommending approval as presented. All right, do we have a motion to accept policy 2.805? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Suttles. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any questions or comment? Mr. Ballard? So with this policy, we designate a purchasing agent. Is that, that correct? Uh, and how does that interface with the city purchasing? Okay, so I'm going to let Ms. Uh, Taylor answer the question about the executive committee, and then I'll talk about how it interacts with the city. Okay. Yeah, so in Tennessee code, it designates the executive committee, which is the board chair and the director of schools, as the purchasing agent. But as you know, at Murfreesboro City Schools, we do have a dedicated purchasing agent. Right. So that's why we have the executive committee slash designee, because the board has designated that duty to the purchasing agent and how it interfaces with the city. I'll take, I can take that. <laughs> we work, so obviously we have, our funds are separate from the city funds, and so it really depends on how the project is being paid for. So our, our general day-to-day -day operations, that's held in uh, Ms. Williams' office with our purchasing agent. If there's a situation where we are collaborating with the city, a lot of times that's on capital improvement. So recently we've done several capital projects with, um, whether it's the county shared bonds, if it's going through city held funds, then we work very closely with their purchasing agent as well. I will say the city's a great partner with us. So even with some of our projects that we're doing, our larger projects out of our district held ESSER funds, because it involves the buildings, we still work very closely with the city's purchasing agents, specifically for the bidding out of the projects and things like that. Ms. Williams, you wanna add anything to that? Okay. Okay. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? If not, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. Board policy 2.806, bids and questions on first reading. Yes, sir. Policy 2.806 outlines the requirements for the purchase of supplies, materials, equipment, and contractual services using bids and quotations. This amendment adds language from the law which requires quotes for purchases less than the bid threshold but greater than 20% of the bid threshold, which is $20,000. And we are recommending approval of this policy as presented. 
of a motion to approve policy 2.806, bids and quotations. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Suttles. Have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Any question or comment? If not, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. 5.106. Policy 5.106 outlines the district's application and employment rules and guidelines. This amendment removes the requirement that a transcript be submitted with the application and aligns the health record requirement for support employees with the same requirements for professional employees. I do want to clarify that this change does not signify we are no longer checking transcripts. Mm -hmm. uh, the state process requires that teachers upload their degrees in the Tennessee Compass mm -hmm. State Platform, so we're able to verify the transcripts there instead of having them submit to us and the state as well uh, separately. And we are recommending approval of this policy as presented. All right, do we have a motion to approve the policy? So moved. Thank you, Mr. Battle. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. I have a question. What is the timeline upon which a person has got to accept or reject employment offer? I'm going to refer to Mr. Rinkster. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Thank you. Any other question or comment? I see none. All in favor of the policy say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. Policy 6.205. Districts are required to have a policy on the comparability of services per federal law. This new policy is TSBA's model policy for comparability of services and it aligns with all requirements and we are recommending approval of this policy as presented. And I think I skipped a policy, uh, Mr. Campbell, so I'm going to go back and read the actual <laughs> motion for the correct one. I apologize. I uh, got ahead of myself there. Uh, to your point, policy 6.205 governs the assignment of students to classes. This amendment adds language required by law stating that class size and pupil-teacher ratios should not exceed the averages allowed by state law, and we are recommending approval of the changes to 6.205. Okay. I have a motion to approve policy 6.205. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Settles. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. Policy 2.300. As I previously said, this is a new <laughs> policy with TB TSBA regarding comparability of services. And uh, this policy outlines how we allocate resources as a district to, to guarantee that all resources are um, given out comparable in each school setting. I have a motion to approve policy 2.300. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Sutton. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any question or comment? Oh, just a question. More? You said this is a new policy from TSBA. Does we already do this, right? It's just we do. We bring it into Yes, we do it as part of our annual process for our federal application. It's actually a requirement for federal applications as well. So um, Mr. it goes through Mr. Marlin's department, and we have to turn in a report every October that actually outlines by school. We count every person, every support staff, to show that each building is staffed comparably. Um, and that's been going on as long as I can remember. Yes. Uh, so now we just have a policy showing that we are doing it as well. Thank you. Any other question? We have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Policy 4.301. Yes, sir. A change to state law requires boards to have a policy on severe weather and training coaches appropriately. This amendment to the interscholastic athletic <coughs> policy adds the required provision on severe weather and the training of athletic coaches. For us, this would obviously apply to our basketball coaches and our cheerleading coaches. And we are recommending this policy as presented. Recommend no. approval. Sir? Mr. Ballard moves for approval? Yes. Thank I second you. him. Mr. Settle seconds. Um, I had a question. I'm trying to find out where it was. Oh, line 13. Let me get it up here so I'll find it. 
Uh, what about homeschool students? So currently our policy outlines that only Murfreesboro City School students may participate in our athletic program. Okay, okay, all right. All right, any other questions or comments? One, one last one. Mr. Ballard? So does this policy, is this new training that we're gonna to have to do or is this just maintaining the training that we have? So we have several trainings our coaches go through including concussion training and sudden cardiac arrest training like that. This training is specifically around heat related illnesses. Um, it's designed for obviously sports that occur outdoors. Our major sports, of course, are basketball and cheer, which are indoor sports. Now we do have a couple teams that have running clubs and maybe have a things that do outside at the school. And so we would apply this to them. So this new training is specifically around heat related illnesses. Okay, thank you. Did you say this includes cheerleader coaches? Yes, sir. It'd be all coaches in the district. Right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Board policy 6.414. Yes, sir. State law requires boards to adopt a policy addressing the prevention and treatment of sudden cardiac arrest. This new policy is the TSBA model policy for the prevention and treatment of sudden cardiac arrest. We are recommending approval of this policy. Um, I do want to clarify, as uh, I just said and Mr. Ballard had asked, we, as in some of the other policies we pre presented tonight, we have been giving our coaches this training. Mm -hmm. This is just putting it officially in policy. I move for approval. <clears throat> All right, sir, thank you. We have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. All right, enrollment request. Yes, sir. Murfreesboro City Schools received an enrollment request from the parent of a sixth grade student who was recently expelled from Rutherford County Schools. The student is a former Murfreesboro City School student. Rutherford County did not allow the student to enroll in their alternative school after his expulsion. State law states that when these requests are made, the director of schools for the school system in which the suspended student requests enrollment will make a recommendation to the Board of Education to either approve or deny the parent's request, and that the recommendation shall only occur after an investigation of the facts surrounding the suspension of, from the former school system. Um, our staff conducted a full investigation, which included a statement from the student's parents, statement from Rutherford County School officials, and a review of the student's discipline records, both from when he was here in Murfreesboro City and in Rutherford County. The board uh, was sent copies of the full investigation on January 12th of this year. Um, upon reviewing the results of the investigation, it is my recommendation to the board to deny this request to enroll. We have a motion to accept the recommendation of the director. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. We have a second. I'll second it. All right, Mr. Suttles, thank you. Now, any question or comment? Right. Mr. Ballard? At what point would, uh, where did it evolve to the, that if a student is expelled from one district that they can apply to another district? Uh, it's like, I can understand to the point of leaving the door open for an opportunity to move, but it also seems like that's just saying we're not able to handle this, so we'll send it to you. And, and I, I just wonder how we got to that point. I'm sure our legislature was involved in that. Yes, it was a law passed by the General Assembly. I'm not sure the legislative history up to that, but it is allowed for in the law, and I'm guessing for the very reason is to allow kids a chance to get educated if they were expelled or suspended from their district. And without an alternative school to turn to, where does this student go? They could be homeschooled. They could go to a private school. Um, they could go to another one of the surrounding counties, Williamson, Wilson, MNPS. Um, there are also statewide um, virtual schools. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going to say. Uh, okay. There's a Connection Academy that would take this student. Uh, it's run by Pearson. 
Okay. There are other options. Thank you. Doesn't Rutherford County have alternative schools? Mm -hmm. They do. Mm -hmm. So the they wouldn't enroll them there. The child could enroll in that, but if Brother County does, and evidently Brother County has not accepted the child in the alternative school, is that right? right. So uh, my understanding from our conversation and the investigation is the child was expelled for a zero tolerance offense. Mm -hmm. The director uh, does have the leeway to remand the student to the alternative school, and in this case, they made the decision not to remand the child to the alternative school. Other questions? Ms. Moore? Uh, yes. It not a question so much as just a sharing thought with the board. Um, I really have struggled with this. Maybe nobody else has, but I, I read the investigation report. I obviously don't want to talk about details in the public forum, but you know, I, I think what I've been struggling with is this idea of, you know, what, what is our, my duty as a board member to? Is it to the system? And I think if it's to the system as a whole, not setting a precedent of accepting expelled students makes sense or is my duty to individual students in Murfreesboro to make sure they get what they need. And if that's my duty, then I feel like with this particular instance, if I felt like it was a, if the student was a danger to anyone, if it wasn't just a really stupid thing that happened, um, you know, if I didn't feel like the student was getting consequences in other places, I don't know. I just feel like what's best for the student really might be to be enrolled in sixth grade in our schools and and i don't know that's what i've been sort of wrestling with is it like about the individual student and what's best for that or the system as a whole so i just kind of wanted to put that out to the board that that is i've just really been sort of wrestling with this as what what the best thing is to do Ms. Dodd. well i believe that um you know i i didn't i think it's sad the whole situation is sad but we as a board are supposed to represent Versailles City students and teachers and parents. And are we going to sacrifice that for one student who used to be a Rutherford County student? So that's just kind of my comment because, you know, there are other options. They can go to that Connections Academy. He can go to that Connections Academy and do just fine. And then the way I understand it, can he go back to mm -hmm. Rutherford County? Starting in the fall. Next year. In the fall. So Next it's year. only a few months. So anyway, that's that was my thinking. I know you're thinking educate the child, but you're talking one child compared to an entire district of children. Yeah, if I and if I thought there was any it could be unsafe. It could be. We don't know. You know, we just don't yeah. know. Yeah. Based when you know, my impression of the investigation, I read it, if I thought there was any danger, I would absolutely agree right. with mm -hmm. you. But I just didn't I didn't get that from it. Mr. Chairman. The child could have, they could apply to an out of county school system, couldn't mm -hmm. they? They could apply to Wilson or DeKalb or Cannon, couldn't they? Couldn't yes. Elizabeth? They can apply to any LEA that they w their parent would transport them to. Okay. And they would, the other LEA would have to, oh, excuse me, I'm saying LEA, the other school district, a lot of people don't know what LEA means in the public, but the other school district would have to go through the same process that this board is going through now where the, their director would have to make the recommendation and the board would have to vote on it. Okay, Mr. Settles. I had some of the same misgivings uh, as Miss um, Moore did and I think what kind of helped me is the realization that it was not uh, a forever expulsion, that he can come back in the fall and that um, lesson learned lesson learned the severity of what happened kind of stuck with me mm -hmm. you know Ray way back here in my in my nowhere I don't know what part of the brain that is but it got stuck back there so that kind of helped me to and knowing that there are other options you know for the for the student of course we know that city schools is the best option for every child not just in Murfreesboro, but all over. <laughs> we just can't get them all. So uh, that's kind of what helped me to kind of tip in the other way is that it wasn't a complete, you know, wash out. He can, as we use the term, redeem himself and, and come back, or he or her, them, they come back. That's what I thought too, Mr. Settles. That's exactly how I felt. Because mm -hmm. it's only a few months. Mm -hmm. and then Mr. Ballard. I just want to say, I, I, Again, all of those things 
went into my understand or trying to process this thing. But at the end of the day, and I, I do this often, is that I think that Dr. Duke is our expert on this. We hired him to make these decisions and lead us in this. So I, I default to Dr. Duke, and he's recommending that we deny this. So I'm going to support that. If I can, if I may, Mr. Yes. Chair, one point of clarity on the exact dates um, is that the suspension, expulsion date was for 93 calendar, 93 days is the record that we received. So mm. I'm not sure, and I'd have to go back and look, and I can, um, I don't know if it's pertinent to the decision making, but I did want to clarify the exact time on the discipline record was 93 days. So. No um, what was 93 days? The expulsion. The expulsion the period. Expulsion. For, so I, I say that to say I'm not sure where those 93 days, if that goes to the end of the school year or if it goes into next year, because typically there may be times where it goes from the date of the incident. So mm -hmm. I just wanted to clarify that for the board um, and make sure that was there. But the expulsion period was for 93 days. Of course, they could also apply to, to right. local private schools. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We don't have a charter yet, but it looks like we're going to Let's do that too. Okay. We have a recommendation. We have a motion. We have a second. And the motion and the second is to approve the recommendation of the director. I think we already passed. Did we not? We already second. We, have we already mm -hmm. voted, I thought. Mm -mm. Right. No, we're not. no, we have not voted. We have not we have voted. Not oh, it's voted. in here in the, okay. Are all those in favor of approving the recommendation from Dr. Duke to deny the request for the student to enroll, please say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you very much. All right, open zones. Yes, sir. Board Policy 6.206 states that upon the recommendation of the director, each year the board will approve which schools will be available for open zoning. That decision will be based on current and future, future available space for students principal recommendations, and other appropriate considerations needed at that time. In your packet tonight, you'll see our proposal for open enrollment for the 2023-2024 school year, which lists the schools being recommended for open zoning, the number of available seats at each school based on current enrollment, and the number of seats to be advertised for open enrollment. And you will see a difference there between the number of currently open seats and what we're advertising as Z uh, zone waiver seats and that is of course to accommodate for growth that may happen it's what we feel comfortable with feeling like we would be able to accept the proposed recommendations and timeline that's on the document also comply with Tennessee code annotated which now outlines the requirement for an open enrollment period in every school district in Tennessee and I'm happy to take any questions you may have We have a question, Ms. Dodd? Um, for the one that says zero, Mitchell Nelson K1, oh, that's proposed number mm -hmm. of open seats. Okay, current number of open seats. Okay, so you're proposing that they're not going to have any open seats. So currently with, and Mitchell Nelson, of course, is a little bit of a different situation because of the dual campuses that they serve, um, and but we still have them as one school listed as the state. And it, what we decided to do with Mitchell Nielsen in the K and one, we are seeing much higher numbers there, but we have lower numbers in second mm -hmm. through sixth grade and a little more space there. So as we accept new waivers, this would allow us to really focus on students in second through sixth grade, and we would not accept any waivers for K and one. Um, I will, I do want to specify these are for new waivers. This is not for families that are currently on waivers. So this would be new seats that would come open. Thank you. And these are new seats within uh, the, the transfers within our own system, so our, not from outside the system? We advertise in the state last year passed a law that legislated um, the timeline that's on that document. Mm -hmm. we, have to, we have to, by law, advertise open seats in schools. We have to give a two-week period. Mm -hmm. Then we accept those zone waivers. If we get above if we get more waivers than the number of seats we have to conduct a lottery last year we did not get more waivers than the number of seats so we did not have to conduct a lottery in any location our board policy does allow us to take out of city waivers 
once we've addressed mm -hmm. in-city requests. So if we were, and I'll use an example of Black Box, which has 25 proposed open seats for waivers, if we were to only receive 21 um, zone waiver requests for in-city requests, mm -hmm. we would then, those other three, be allowed if there was an out-of-city applicant who wanted to put in a request. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Do we need a, we don't need a motion to approve this, do we? We do need a motion we to approve. We do need a motion to approve the open, the open okay. Right. And I offered that motion, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right, we have a second to Mr. Settle's motion. Second. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Now, any other questions or comments? I see none. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. aye. Aye. Any opposition? And I see none, thank you. All right, approval of custodial services contract. Yes, sir. In an effort to address the ongoing issues we've had with staffing in our custodial department, we have explored outside partnerships to help improve both staffing issues and the daily cleaning of our buildings. After conducting research and getting references from several other school districts, the decision was made to explore a partnership with ABM Industries. The attached contract in your packet will allow ABM to perform the custodial services for all of our schools and our central office. This partnership will potentially result in a significant cost savings for the district, while also giving our existing custodians opportunities to remain in their current position. ABM has the ability to recruit more potential custodians throughout Middle Tennessee as well. We requested and were granted permission to purchase from the bid which was awarded to Wilson County Schools uh, last school year. If approved, this agreement will be in effect from April 1st, 2023 through March 31st, 2024, and will continue thereafter for two successful periods of 12 months, subject to termination pursuant to the terms and conditions in the agreement. As the board knows, we discussed this several times throughout January through both individual meetings and collectively during our work session. I would like to ask Mr. Ringstaff to come forward and discuss some of the steps he's done and provide the board an update since our last January workshop meeting where we first discussed, or the last time we discussed this. Thank you. For the last two weeks, I have gone to every school and met with all the full-time custodians. There was a lot of, uh, a mixture, okay, one, uh, first shift uh, ends at two o'clock, second shift comes in at uh, one o'clock, so there was an hour there that I could meet with all the custodians. Any part-time custodians were welcome to join us. And yesterday I met with the last school, and also always, if, once you hit the first school, everybody knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> I had to change my approach uh, as I went along. <laughs> and I started out talking uh, about the same thing Dr. Duke just mentioned, the challenges that we faced as a school district with custodial. And I told them, we specialize in educating students. There are companies out there who specialize in cleaning schools. And they understood, we talked a lot about the company coming forward, and I would always end it, please give them a chance, hear them out, listen to them, and it could be very beneficial to you. Uh, we haven't lost any custodians so far because of our change. And uh, once this contract's signed, we will get the new company in uh, in a couple of weeks and start meeting with our custodians, our existing custodians. So we're, we're excited. I think the custodians, they're a little apprehensive, a little nervous about change, but uh, they think, they know that it could possibly benefit them. Any questions? This is, in essence, a three-year contract agreement? One year with the possibility of extending it for another two years. Okay. Now, with the possibility or the probability? I, when I read it, I oh, kind of thought it was like, we're going into it for one year, but then the year two and three is automatically there. Unless we find a reason not to, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, all right. Um, what happens to, if the contract is ended, let's say after a year, and ABM has gone out and has purchased equipment that we're no longer purchasing, 
What happens to that equipment? Does that refer back to us? No. Or does ABM keep it? And if they keep it, then that means we've got to go back and buy new equipment. Yes, sir. We've just spent, uh, we've bought whole new equipment for our custodial uh, with ESSER funds recently, and we expect that to last at least another year. So we're going to be using our equipment for at least another year. But does that equipment, when once we agree to this agreement, does that equipment transfer over to them? No, sir. That's our equipment. If they purchase equipment later on down the road, that is their equipment. Right. Okay, so if they purchase it later, okay, that's theirs, and, and they will keep, if the contract's ended, they will keep that equipment. They will take it away. Okay. Um, holiday pay? Holiday is not working? Who determines that, or is that just set standard? It's in the contract that the holidays, that they will not work, and we've, uh, they do not normally pay holiday pay. We are going to grandfather anybody who's been here three years or longer as of June 30th, we will continue to pay them. We will pay this new company their holiday pay for them as long as they're employed with us. All right, do we currently, let's say Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's on Thursday. <coughs> we don't go to school that week. So what is the work schedule for custodians that week? Is it just they get that Thursday off or do they get other days off with our students and they're scheduled to work Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday because we have ESP, and they're off Thursday and Friday. Okay. So Friday is a, a, a paid holiday, basically. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Ballard and Ms. Long? How does this – I know you explained it, and I apologize for my short memory on this, but how does this report now – does it report back to each principal, or does it report to – is there a – uh, in the org chart, who does it report to? They will have two managers within a district. More than likely, they will split up the schools. One will have six, the other will have seven, things like that. And then they will develop a relationship with the principal of the schools that they're assigned to. And the principals can be involved as much as they want to or as little as they want to. But they will be asked to communicate with, through surveys and things like that how the custodians are performing, how their school's looking. So if the principal has – is has a problem with the way that something's being done with ABM, <clears throat> who does he turn to? They can pick up the phone and call that manager that's responsible for that school, or they can always call me. Okay, we come to you. Yes, they can. Okay. To, point, to piggyback on what he said, and one of the things that we were pleased with as we looked at this is that the company would be hiring those two managers who would only serve our district. So they would be fully devoted to us um, those touch points to make sure that we had the appropriate points of contact um, and address any situations that may arise. Ms. Long? Um, the overall feedback from our employees, mm -hmm. it how, was, how do you feel about all that? It was positive. It was good. And uh, they're going to give them a shot. They're going to listen to them and uh, the new company going to come in, walk them through the process of becoming a, one of their employees and to be very gentle. and I, I explained to him, we want the transition to be as smooth as possible. On a Friday, you will be an MCS employee. On a Monday, you will be one of their employees mm -hmm. with no change, with very little change. So y'all discuss pay scale and schedules and all of that? Yes. Okay. I've told them what they will start out, that no custodian will go down in pay. Most custodians will receive a pay increase. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Being this looks like three years, what if, and let's hope it happens, we come on board with school plant number 14? How do we, how do they address that in their, or, or do you know? Adjustments will be made as far as the cost and things like that. Okay. And they will determine that cost, I guess, primarily, mutually, right? Mutually, mutually between mutually. The, the vendor and the client. Okay. We get a volume discount, right? <laughs> of course, <laughs> yes. That's right. Well, you know, State Farm Insurance, you get your <laughs> house and your car, you get a little bit of rate, don't you? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Ralph. I know you've done a lot of work on this. Thank you. Now, we have a motion to approve this recommendation. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Settle. Do we have a second? Second. 
Thank you, Ms. Long. Now, any other question or comment? Just a, a comment okay. that, you know, I was, when I first heard thinking about outsourcing this, I, it gave me pause because I feel like typically that means worse conditions for employees we had versus what we're going to do. But I felt really reassured after we spoke with Mr. Ringstaff and telling us that, like you just said, that no employee is going to go down and pay mm -hmm. and many will go up. Um, and that made me feel a lot better about it and, and the other accommodations that they've been willing to make um, to keep our employees and to keep them in a good, um, a good job. Yeah, I, I would I commend Ralph from what he's told us. He's done an excellent job with this and, and has brought in. There are a lot of His questions. Point. <laughs> Fingers see, crossed right? that it'll work. <laughs> I, well, I think we all have that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you, and thank you again, Ralph. Thank you. Budget amendment for the custodial contract. Yes, sir. This amendment uh, piggybacks off of the motion and that was just passed, which transfers a total of seven hundred and two thousand dollars within the operation of plant budget category to create a new custodial services line item from savings in our personnel and supplies area. This increase will cover the cost of the group contract from April 1st, 2023 through June 30th of 2023. All increases are covered by savings in other categories. There is no new revenue and no change to fund balance. And we are recommending approval of this budget amendment. We have a motion to approve the budget amendment. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Moore. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any questions? All in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Reports and information. Bell time for 2023 and 24. Yes, sir. In your board packet tonight, you'll see a listing of bell times for each school for the 23-24 school year that we wanted to provide for your information tonight. Uh, these bell times are consistent with the current bell times with the exception of Case and Lane Academy. For the 23-24 school year, Case and Lane Academy will move to an 8.30 start time and a 3.30 end time. This change will allow us to better utilize transportation services on the west side of town. ESP services will still be offered at Case and Lane from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day, just as it is in all of our city schools. I will say we've already spoken to the Case and Lane staff about this change and we will begin letting families know in the days ahead so that they can know early about this change and can plan accordingly. Uh, we are ha I'm happy to answer any questions you may have regarding this information. Right, any question on the bell times? Nope. Ms. Long? Your response, uh, the response from the families? Uh, we haven't notified the staff. the staff. Yes, we met with the staff. Um, in fact, I got an email from Ms. Cox this morning and told me uh, she gave a survey and um, well over 85% of the current staff were very positive about the change. And the ones that, we, <coughs> that do know it may cause a, an issue in their life because, of course, it involves mm -hmm. their own families, right, and the impact it has. We're, we've already told them, and I actually have a meeting with them again on Thursday, the entire faculty, to say we are going to make sure we work with them. If they need to be at a 730 school on the west side of town, we're going to make sure we put them where they need to be so that they can be um, take care of their family needs as well. That's great. Thank you. We need a motion to approve these. No, sir. That was just for I information. So. Okay. Transportation for 2023 and 24. Yes, sir. We have historically in Murfreesboro City Schools designated parent responsibility zones for transportation as a half mile from the school where there are no major roads or intersections present. This half mile radius that we use in Murfreesboro City Schools is significantly less than the one and a half mile area that's designated by the state for transportation funding. For the 23-24 school year, we are looking to increase the parent responsibility zone from a half mile to three-fourths of a mile at Overall Creek Elementary, Salem Elementary, and Scales Elementary to help ensure adequate and consistent transportation services to all students in the district. The increased parent responsibility zone at these three schools will still take major roads and intersections into consideration. In your packet, we've included the outline of the proposed zones that you saw at the work session in January as well. 
No changes will be made for children with disabilities who require special education transportation. Um, and I'm happy to answer any additional questions the board may have since our last discussion um, regarding this, but we wanted to provide these publicly again for the board to review. Any questions on the transportation maps to change? No, but I do have a comment. Okay. I would like to commend Dr. Duke and staff for forward thinking on this because transportation is still going to be a problem for the foreseeable future, not just here, uh, Rutherford County, Wilson County, Metro Nashville, you name it, they're having issues with getting and keeping qualified bus driver. Shout out to my dad who will be retiring <laughs> at the end of the school year from driving a school bus. He'll be um, uh, 77 years old mm -hmm. and he's going to finally quit driving a school bus. Does he want to be a bus aide? He, he does <laughs> not. I, <laughs> I'm revoking his privileges, but he's retiring from the job. <laughs> right. <laughs> but he, um, he reluctantly told me uh, last year that this would be his last year driving a school bus. So this is the second career. So anybody out there that would like to have a second career, um, you can come and work for us as, as a uh, city schools bus driver. That would be great. Uh, but, yeah, it, so thank you for thinking ahead and outside the box on how we can make this work. And we are still far below the state's um, recommendation or whatever mm -hmm. requirement. I don't know what you call it. But, yeah, we're still doing good. Ms. Moore? I want to add to your thanks just for doing this so early in the year, both this and the bell times, so parents mm -hmm. have plenty of time to think about how this might change things for next year and they can adjust yeah, I, accordingly. I appreciate that. And I know we spoke in the um, meeting as well, but publicly for the parents as we communicate this, we've already talked to the department head meeting with Ms. Powers and ESP, so families that may be impacted by that increase of a quarter of a mile will, of course, have access to ESP services if that better fits their needs as mm -hmm. well. If they're typically bus drivers, but they'd rather put them in ESP, of course, we'll have that there for them as well. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Enrollment report. Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening, Good evening Joe Marlin. Short timer. Short timer. <laughs> <laughs> Not a real short time. <laughs> But I can tell you exactly how many days. <laughs> <laughs> Hours, minutes. Uh, I, it's on my phone. There's, a, there's an app for that. <laughs> well, I understood there was a vote up to renege that retirement. Yeah. That's right. Well, I do want to share some enrollment information with you. Um, if you look at the enrollment p page first, uh, uh, this month, the um, at the end of, of let me let me clarify that first. This goes through um, the fourth period of, uh, of uh, which ends on December the 14th. And apparently, I'm losing the ability to speak as I'm getting closer to retirement. So it's a good thing that I'm retiring. Uh, this the fourth period ends ended on uh, December the 14th. The fifth period will end at the end of this month. So we'll have a new report at the end of the next month. Um, but this covers the first 80 days, and at, at that point, um, our enrollment was 9,335, which was an increase of only five students, but it was an increase, and so every little bit helps. If you notice across the bottom of the page in the green, uh, that includes uh, the K-6 number uh, uh, and those numbers across there. If you look at the very bottom of the page, you'll notice the BEP-funded numbers, and we're going to start including that in our in our reports uh, from this point on. We've noticed there's some trends there that we want to point out, and we want to make sure that we're watching. But the BEP funded part, you know, because that's where our money comes from, we want to draw attention to that in our future reports. Mr. Marlin, can I interrupt just sure. for a second? And Ms. Marlin, I had this conversation today. You know, last year we went through the rezoning, and we've talked all throughout this year about our numbers. And as we looked at this specific report, which talks about where we ended, where we are compared to where we were last year, and I asked him to kind of relook at this because I think it may be sending a, a wrong message because, of course, this includes our pre-K students, which we, we addressed some of those classes last year due to space. Um, and actually, when you look at our K-6 enrollment, as he said, we are not, we are very close to where we were last year. In fact, at every period, we have been up from where we were last year in our K-6 enrollment, 
up until December, which we are actually two below, and that probably has more to do with students leaving at the end of the semester. So I expect that to go back up. So even though the report does show that we are under where we ended last year, that is mainly due to pre-K and situations like that. When you look at our K-6 population, our enrollment for every period up until the December one has been above where we were at that time the previous year. Thank you. Mm. And moving on, if we'll look at our uh, pupil teacher ratio, the second sheet in our report tonight, um, numbers remain uh, uh, in a positive uh, manner. We are where we want to be. If you look at the bottom of the page, under the green um, section, you can see that our K through th three uh, numbers remain in the 18 to around 18 per classroom, uh, 18 to one. And um, at, in our four through six, those numbers are, are remain in the in the 20 range, in 20 to one. At the bottom of the page, there are those the exact numbers for the uh, for those two grade bands, and that remains in the realm that we want it to stay in. The third report has to do with truancy. I'll take you to that report. Uh, the, for the fourth period, our number of students that have that have been have missed more than 10 days unexcused. Uh, the total for this period is 151, which is a little bit higher than the previous period. We expect this number to increase through, throughout the course of the year, uh, but that number is 151. And um, uh, Ms. Taylor and I are working on those, those numbers, trying to work with the families to make sure that we are uh, intervening and we're getting, uh, giving them opportunities to help us remove the barriers to, to good attendance. And finally, the chronic absenteeism report the fourth page, the number uh, of students who have missed eight or more days, that's whether they're excused, whether they're excused or unexcused, just eight total days. That number at the end of the fourth period is 1,665. Mm -hmm. um, and for our newer board members, we expect this number to decline each period because the, the amount of, of days required uh, to, that are measured uh, increases and we have fewer and fewer students that go through that. But so we're in, in that trend now and that's, lo that's looking the way we expect for it to look at this time period. Any questions? Ms. Dodd. Uh, so unexcused, all right. What would be like excused absence would be like they brought a doctor note in. Doctor's note. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is, the truancy is 10 plus days Unexcused. unexcused so if they had to go to the doctor that's not counted that's not counted right in this and it's, it's possible that they could have just as many excused as they have unexcused i see right okay but then the, the, then that would count under the chronic absent right. absentee right. part mm -hmm. okay. because um that's more than 10 percent of the number of days for the for the time period so all right thank you mm -hmm. Mr. Settles. And there are interventions also for chronic absence, not just truancy, correct? We yes. still look, yeah, because I don't want it to seem as though we only kind of get involved when they're truant, but even chronic absences are rings and, 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 and even more so because uh, we're using a multi tiered system mm -hmm. where we are trying to reach out to all families to let them know the importance of attendance because one thing that we realize is we have the best school system and with the best curriculum the best teachers but if kids don't attend okay. we're not able to provide the best right. education that we Absolutely. can and I don't want to get financial with it but it does affect something else money-wise right sure it does, it. Of course it does. Uh, yeah of course Ms. Dodd. okay so on the truancy thing are those cumulative those numbers are cumulative, yes. Okay. So the, the students that were yeah. chronically absent, uh, or excuse me, that were truant at the beginning Truants. are truant now. It's added up, okay. Right. In what way are we reaching out? To In what way are we reaching out to the truant? Um, there's a, we're, we use a, uh, a multi-tiered system. So the schools at day five, at uh, five days of unexcused, the schools sent out a letter to the parents. Okay. Uh, upon that point, then they're asked to come in for a conference. Um, the schools meet with a team of, of people at the school, meet with the parents and, and actually have them sign a contract. The contract uh, gives terms about um, 
what the expectations are that the child would miss maybe no more than one more day th during the next six weeks period or something to that effect. Um, they're, they're, th they talk about barriers that the parents may be experiencing. If they're having problems with transportation, if they're having problems with health issues, uh, if the child is avoiding school mm -hmm. and they're having problems with maybe, you know, the, to, to find out if maybe the child feels like they're being bullied or they don't have friends. Uh, and they try to help overcome some of those obstacles. Uh, the parents are obligated to to, uh, to come back in again for other meetings, and we do some hold some of these meetings virtually, so it, to make it uh, convenient for the parents because of work schedules and so forth. Uh, and then um, after those meetings, if if uh, the child continues to miss, then we intervene by uh, reaching out uh, and and. We will have additional meetings, and that's what Ms. Taylor and I are doing at this time, to bring them into the central office to see what, what other things we might be able to do. We've had several of those uh, meetings um, since we've put, since we formed that uh, truancy board, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's the way that we reach out. In your experience, have you seen repeated uh, truancy in um, multiple years? Same families showing up over and over and over. I think I think yes. that's fair to say we've seen that. Okay. Yes, not always, but there are a few um, families that I've seen year to year, mm -hmm. and then also families that have siblings. So one sibling started out being truant, and then of course younger brother or sister is truant, and then also um, I'm in frequent communication with the Rutherford County attendants. Um, teachers there and frequently we see that even the students in the upper levels when they have younger siblings it's a truancy anywhere from elementary middle all the way up through high school <laughs> and then when the instances where they do go to court uh, oftentimes when the parents names brought up the people at the juvenile court said well this parent was truant as well so that's what we try to do in our meetings with Joe is get to the root and stop the cycle of right. truancy mm -hmm. um, so the kids will come to school and their kids will come to school one day. And to add to what Elizabeth said, I think one of the powerful things, and Mr. Merlin talked about the meeting where you have the parents sign a contract, which is great because we want to be really clear on expectations, what we need from parents. But the most powerful part of those meetings are the guidance counts. The school counselor is very involved, the social worker is involved, mm -hmm. and it's really more about what can we do to help make sure your child's in Building school. a team. Right, is, yeah. you know, do you need, and we've given out alarm clocks. We've, right. we've put them in, in touch with other outside agencies, but we really work to say, what's the root of this issue and how do we solve that first? Okay. Thank you, appreciate your work. I got a question. There's more. Mr. Marlin, I, you may not know this, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know some of our schools, individual schools, have tried to do some new things this year um, to work on absenteeism. Do you know for those if, how their numbers are looking compared to this point last year, if it seems to be making a difference, if we've well, seen anything really? You know, one thing we know, that when you pay attention to, to, you know, to particular um, data, especially attendance, it does make a difference. Um, I think you know, it makes a difference. Teachers try harder to make sure that kids know that something interesting is coming up, so you don't want to miss this, especially those children who may be struggling. Um, but um, you know, principals try harder. Principals reach out to families uh, more. Uh, we communicate better just because we have data in front of us and we're, we're really looking at this. So I think our, our schools are understanding the importance. And, you know, it, it seems second nature, but it's really, you know, it's, it's hard to, uh, to recognize that it, kids slip through the cracks if we don't you know pay, play, pay close attention and so our teachers are paying attention our, our administrators are paying attention our central office is paying attention and I think it just makes a it has made a difference I think we've seen that I do know that uh, I'm trying to remember the numbers um, that uh, Bradley had 40 something percent uh, chronically absent last year and at this point they're at the 20 percent 20 Two to three. Yeah, Bradley is really what I was thinking because I know right. they have really put a lot of focus on that this year. So I was hoping they so we, we are seeing results. differences. That's yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. And many of the schools are offering incentives mm -hmm. to the parents, gift cards and that kind of thing for uh, that I've seen. They're, they're looking at ways to help draw attention to the importance of being there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it goes back to what we started saying several years ago that every day matters. And I think we're, we're getting the message across yeah. more and more each day. So. If I could add, Mr. Rocha has done a, just a fantastic job at Bradley 
really making getting students to school a priority. And, and as Joe said, the data is showing it is working. Um, so kudos to him. I want to spotlight Northfield Elementary. They did a pancake breakfast for families by invitation only on a Saturday to talk about the importance of attendance with some select families and had some good showing up there where they got to meet with the attendance clerk who's sending them the letters and mm. doing the call mm. and build that relationship there. Um, I know uh, Ms. Strebel has done, done just an excellent job at Black Fox uh, communicating with parents every week on her Friday message. A lot of our schools have built incentives in specifically around Fridays because we know kids are out on Fridays. And then this Friday, I'm very glad to say, Hobgood Elementary, um, I'm very excited about this. They have a new attendance incentive where parents can actually earn um, attendance dollars for having their students at school and they're going to be able to come and shop for basic household supplies using the funds they've credited through attendance and that launches this Friday. Miss, uh, I was over at Hobgood today, Miss Bell was setting up in the gymnasium. They can come and use their attendance dollars to buy things like laundry detergent and other things they may need in their house. So again, helping to build that connection with families. So um, if you're out and about Friday, you may want to drop by Hopgood and, and their parents are registering for that. So it's gonna be great. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Marlin? Thank you, sir, good report. All right, personnel report. Yes, sir. Green staff or Dr. Duke? That we're just gonna say the personnel report's in your packet. If y'all have any questions, uh, we're happy to answer them. Yeah, I have one question. Ralph. Okay. I really don't. I just wanted to see that sweater again. I like it a lot. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, revenue and expenditure report. Good evening, board. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Oh. Hi. It's good to see everyone. And before you, we have three pages related to revenues and expenditures. And there is a one page summary that total revenue and total expenditure. You'll see a negative number. The difference between the two is $1.6 million. Not to be concerned. Mm -hmm. That usually flips on the plus side in January when we start receiving county property taxes. And speaking of county property taxes, I do want to bring something to your attention on the revenue report. And for the board members who were here last at the end of last fiscal year, Rutherford County Schools voted to move pennies off the property tax off of the general school fund and move it into a separate school uh, account for capital projects. That money that was moved off of the shared pennies, off of the pennies is not shared with Murfreesboro City Schools. We are starting to see the impact of mm -hmm. that um, change, pennies off the, off the property taxes. So we are just this month for the month of December starting to see some significant property tax dollars come in less than what they were at this time last year. We're seeing about a 17% decline wow. on the property taxes. Wow. And there are multiple taxes that are shared with the uh, county schools. We are, um, and the percentage is based on the number of the percentage of students and it's a state calculation based on weighted average at certain times of the reporting periods. Our students, as you just heard, are, are pretty consistent. What was not consistent was that shift that uh, pennies and pennies do make a difference. So we are watching. It is that it, we're watching the trend. The property tax dollars are the big property tax dollars we'll see in January and, and February. So we're, we're watching that and looking at what are our options if we start to be, dip below 
for the board members who were here, you will hear us talk about local maintenance of effort. Mm -hmm. So we're watching that very carefully and we've reached out to the state and, but the main area is in the property taxes. So um, if you have any questions on that, we're, we're, the sales tax, however, we're, we're, on, we're increasing about 12.5% over where we were this time last year. Our sales tax continues to come in pretty consistently. The, uh, the big sources of revenue, property tax, sales tax, the state BEP funds, and the allocation we receive from the city. Three of those big pots of money are consistent, consistent. It's the property tax that we watch, especially this time of year. So we are watching that trend very carefully, but I did want to just put that bug in your ear. Ms. What Williams, are, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, if, if I can add, as she said, we of course discussed this last year at the end of the year when we found out it was happening in, in depth, and I, and I know several of you reached out to your county commissioners to help voice the concerns that the students of Murfreesboro City may not be getting the funding um, that is the appropriate share that they would historically get. Um, I do want to point out for our new board members that that change happened after we had already passed our budget. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we have been watching it really closely. So there we may, as we continue to watch it, if this trend shows, have to come back and do a budget amendment to possibly lower that tax. And of course, that would also mean looking at our expenditures as well. Ms. Dodd. Okay, so explain this to me like you're explaining it to a first grader, okay? <laughs> what did they do about the pennies? Yes. Okay. So what's the best way to tell me? Yeah, it's like. The pie. Okay. And they're $2, Sam, Trey, I don't have that number in my brain today right now, but it's $2 and some odd cents that is set aside in the total property tax for Rutherford County. Of that pie, $2.84 is set aside for education. Because we have two school districts, we split that portion of education. And we get 15%, roughly 15%. Rutherford County has about 85% of that. So it's a series, it, it really is a series of calculations. So the, the local body, the county commission, voted based on the school board recommendation to shift, I believe it was seven pennies off of that allocation that's shared with education. So it, the total dollar. I'm lost. I'm sorry, sir. Move it where they, they voted to. They moved it specifically to a different line item in the county budget that is set aside for education capital projects mm -hmm. for the county school the system. The county school system, but not. And seven. once they moved yes. that seven cents to that educational capital project line, it no longer became a shareable penny, mm -hmm. if that makes we sense. We lost our share of that. We so lost they gave it So, to so the they can do that? Capital yes. improvements. Right. Yes. Essentially, they took the seven cents, gave it to Rutherford County for their capital improvements, and they said to us, uh, you're not going to get it. We don't have to share this with you. We get 100% of this. So, so then if we have capital improvements, look to the city, basically. As Ms. Williams said, we, we have 14.7%, and that's, re, that's redone every year. So currently our proportional share is 14.7%. I'm sorry, 14.7%, uh, close to 15. So for lack of a better word, the education money that goes to the schools that we receive 14.7% of decreased mm -hmm as a whole because they move seven pennies to the capital project line item. Okay, I have a question. So can we do that? No. 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 No, we have, there are certain maintenance of effort is just part of it. There's also a fund balance test. So there are certain, you have to drive within the very narrow lanes of 3% of test of maintenance of effort test. So we would not be able to do that. And we are um, mindful of how that has impacted our local dollars. And we've been tracking that very carefully. And we're 
just now in the month of December starting to see the November prop property taxes come in and what that reduction of pennies, what that really looks like. So we're monitoring that. We estimated somewhere around a million, a million and a half dollar impact. So we adjusted our budget at the beginning of this fiscal year accordingly so we would still meet uh, maintenance of effort and 3% fund balance and still be able to operate with that without uh, dipping into fund balance um, as much as we, any more than we did. So it really is, um, a, there are certain parameters that we have to meet and there are several layers of calculations that do go yes. into it. Well, I appreciate you being on top of it. Well, thank you. And you explained it very well. Oh, thank well, you. I've got another question to follow up. Yes, sir. Is this a permanent move of these pennies by the county commission or is, do they say they're going to do it for a time certain or we just want to do it long enough to find out if the city gets really mad that they don't have the money that we've promised to give them? Uh, it's a legislative decision. I believe it can be um, changed annually, but it would take the county commission voting well, on that. Okay, yeah. I didn't know if it was, you know, just for like five years we're going to do this mm -hmm. because Permanent. As you know, and I know, mm -hmm. once that money starts flowing, there's no way they're going to turn that spigot off. I wouldn't. You know, they're not going to come back next year and say, oh, we feel so bad that we took money from the city schools. So let's backtrack and do something different. So I get what you're saying, but mm -hmm. not likely going to happen. This has been a bone of contention, the percentage. And correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed like I can remember from 40 years ago. It, at one point in time, it was 17 to 18 percent, because you take the total number of students in Rutherford County, mm -hmm. and then you take the the percentage that Mercer City educates. Mm -hmm. So that's the percentage that Mercer City gets. Right. Yes. And I guess as as enrollments have increased, it's probably increased more overall countywide. And it has citywide, so that's why the percentage is, what did you say, 14.7 now? 14.7. And then, the, yeah. then they move this money that you're talking about from into capital improvement for the capital yeah. improvements. Therefore, unless we build something, we don't reap any of that benefit. Isn't that correct? When, this, when the county goes to the bond market, for elementary students that serve the county as a whole, Murfreesboro City Schools does get a portion of those bond proceeds, and it's the same percentage, the weighted average percentage that the state calculates every year. So we do, so if uh, when Plainview Elementary opened, if they go to the bond market to uh, and in addition to an elementary school, then Murfreesboro City Schools shares in that, legally shares in, in that. So there are different requirements for the bond market as, as far as how that's uh, calculated, but the percentage shared is, is consistent with the property tax calculation and the sales tax calculation. I want to emphasize again that calculation is done at the state level every year mm -hmm. um, and we actually get that report that says this is what your proportional piece of that is again we know multi-system districts are not unique to this area there are 145 school districts in this state and only 95 schools 95 counties mm -hmm. excuse me so 95 counties 145 school districts so yeah. the state does this across the board I, I do want to go back to your specific question um, that you asked Mr. Campbell, the county borrowing bond, going to the bond market for new buildings, we do get that proportional share, again, because city residents are paying county taxes. Right. And that's what but I want to be very clear. But is that only if they're building an elementary school? If, if they would, yes, sir. If they, if they go to the bond market for additions to the high school, they would not have any don't access get anything. No, sir. But this, these specific pennies they moved last year to go into their capital project, um, line item that we do not have access to or we do not get a our proportional share of that money it was so just what kind of it was just their way of taking right. guaranteeing they're going to keep that money for yes. county schools rather than or county yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. what kind of recourse do we have 
We don't. That's my question. We can take a look at the beverage tax. Because at the what? Alcoholic beverage tax that we have control over, that no. we could say we're not going to share that with the county because it's the city money. So actually, we, we still legally, that is set forth in state law as well. Uh, we do share that proportionally and have to. We did, that was recalculated this year, but it is based just off of students in the city limits because it is a city tax. Um, so that was recalculated. If you see on the ex revenue report, you'll actually see an increase in that from last year. I think it's, it's broken down on that. Mm -hmm. So we are seeing an increase in there as we recalculate that, but the, the proportional share for that is also driven by state law as well. So I think what Wes is saying, let's take our pennies out of the, the beverage tax and put it in our capital improvement, <laughs> Mr. Shacklett. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it, that's what Wes said. It was really not even me. So I will say that is also driven by state law and uh, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Shacklin and the commissioner are limited to what they can do there. Again, I think one thing I'd like to point out is, you know, um, with that movement, unfortunately, I think for us was the timing of it and that it happened after we had prepared a budget and had a budget passed. Um, but Ms. Williams is continuing to, to monitor that and to watch it very closely. And we wanted to flag it because, again, this month with this report is really when we began to see mm -hmm. a little bit of the impact of that. And so we're having to adjust accordingly to make sure that we can uh, continue to offer the services we need to offer um, kind of after we had, uh, had passed our expenditures. So you will let us know when it gets to a dangerous level. Yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Moore. So um, you mentioned something about maintenance of effort. And I've, so my understanding of maintenance of effort is that the local, local governments have to provide, they're on the hook for a certain percentage, kind of yes. the state gives us so much and the locals have to do so much. Mm -hmm. So those pennies, that million or whatever that came off, mm -hmm. Was that part of a maintenance of effort that's now gone and the city might be on the hook for change, for replacing that that the county pulled off? I'm just trying to figure if that adjusts what the city is now on the hook for because of this change. We have to budget at least what we budgeted last year in local dollars. So there are 32 different uh, um, accounts that go into revenue accounts and about half of those are considered and calculated in, the, in that local revenue. Mm -hmm. So the, the goal is to look at our current last year's budget compared to this year's budget. And I would say within with sales tax to look at those other local sources of revenue that could potentially make up for that loss of so property So that was tax. part of maintenance of effort that got pulled off and now is not there, is that? And the that property tax, yes. That? Okay, yes. so that does have to be made up for somehow. Yes, and we adjusted that in sales tax. Okay. So the local option sales tax was, ex is, remains extremely robust and consistent. And we were able to adjust increase the sales tax when we had to bring the reduce the property tax down to a, a, a more realistic level mm -hmm. so within those total local dollars we do have flexibility but we still have to meet that maintenance of effort i will say as well we do budget as we've talked about before really conservatively with mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. spe specifically our local option sales tax we budget that that was a, a conversation a question i actually got from the city council last year when they approved our budget um, because what we actually receive or what we have historically received has been higher than what we have budgeted for and we do that again to be conservative so that um, we know sales tax can change so that we can prevent having to go back and say we haven't met maintenance of effort. So that's why we budget those numbers very conservatively. Mm -hmm. And that's why we may be bringing a budget amendment to the board for mm -hmm. approval based on conversations with Dr. Duke and we'll, we'll definitely get input from the state fiscal department of ed and work within all of the legal parameters that we have to to work within our previously approved local funding. Okay, thank you, that helps. 
Thank you. So we are watching that carefully, and, and I appreciate your questions. We appreciate what you do. Well, thank you. We don't very understand much. what you do, but we appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you, ma'am, very much. Thank you. All right, director's update. Dr. Duke? Yes, yeah, just a few updates uh, for the board tonight to have on your radar. One is uh, we know that we are well into second semester now, coming up on the end of January. And later this week, actually on Thursday, every third grade parent in our district will be receiving a literacy report home. We have finished our winter benchmark screening. And so every parent will receive a literacy report of where their child currently is performing as well as a letter that outlines the current legislation as it is currently written. Um, and we've flagged on that letter whether that child, based on their current scores, are at a low risk, some risk, or high risk of being impacted by the retention requirement uh, that's in the state legislation, that's in the law as it's written now. We're also pointing them to two Zoom meetings that we'll be holding on next Thursday, February 2nd, and we'll make sure the board gets these links as well. We're doing one at noon for parents that may want to join during the day during their lunch hour, and we're doing one at five o'clock to answer questions and help kind of let parents know kind of where they are based on what they see now with what will in reality be the last set of benchmark data we have before the actual 10 ready assessment uh, that the law is currently based on. So wanted to point that out so parents are aware in case you hear from parents on that. The second thing is that we have our job fair. Believe it or not, we are already gearing up to hire for next school year. We have student teachers that will be graduating. Uh, they graduate in December. More will be starting their student teaching now. And so February 11th from 9.30 to 11.30 at Scales Elementary, once again, we'll be having our MCS job fair. It's going to be a great event. For, we encourage everyone to come out this year something different not just will, will we be looking for and talking with certified personnel but we'll also be opening up and have uh, transportation will be there school nutrition will be there so if there are families or if there are individuals looking for jobs outside of the teaching profession maybe interested in being an ea they'll be able to talk to people that day as well at our job there uh, the final update I have is, of course, we are finishing up our math textbook adoption process. We have narrowed that down to, the committee has narrowed that down to three possible contenders right now. And this week um, is parent preview week. So we have all the materials set up at our central office where any parent can come by the central office from eight to four between uh, now and Friday and look at the materials, preview the materials, get their hands on them. We've also sent out today an email to every um, parent in the district with online links that they can go and review some of this stuff online and fill out a feedback form online as well. So in that process of seeking lots of parental feedback through our math textbook adoption. And Mr. Chairman, those are all my updates. Okay, thank you. I had a question for Troy on one of his updates. You mentioned two. <laughs> You mentioned two Zoom meetings, one at 12 and one at 5, um, surrounding the third grade thing. Yes, sir. Are those Zoom meetings going to be recorded so that even if I miss both of those, I can go back later and, and Yes, and sir. Watch? We will make sure those are recorded and we can send those out to okay. our parents as needed. Thank you. That was it, Butch. I didn't have anything Thank else. Thank you. On the other <laughs> business, uh, Ms. Long, can you give us kind of an update of your work with the legislature and I what can. they're doing I can. to us or for us. Y'all are well aware that general session is in now. Yeah. There are lots and lots of chatter about um, uh, the third grade Crap. law. Um, we look for a lot of amendments to be drafted. They are all due on January 31st, so I would encourage you to pay attention to what is um, being uh, written. And, and, I'll, and I'll keep you uh, abreast as well. Um, we've been watching for quite some time. Uh, you know, the legislators are saying that they have not had such an influx of, mm -hmm. of uh, phone calls and parents yeah. and, you know, concern, obviously. But it's not just about that. There's, there's other things on the table. I've been in contact with the entire uh, educational committees with the Senate and the um, the state representatives and have gotten some great feedback um, 
So I feel like uh, we're being heard, but if there's anything um, from your side that I need to uh, convey to them, I'll be more than glad to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that. Any questions for Ms. Long? Nope. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. We will meet again on February 28th. Mark that on your calendar. We'll not meet on the 14th. Because Mr. Settles need to take his wife. Oh, is that why? <laughs> Valentine's Day, in case you didn't know. Let's double date. There you go. <laughs> All right, anything else coming for this board tonight? If not, do we have a motion to adjourn? So move, Mr. Chairman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Aye.